Straight ahead, we'll be talking to Dr. Joffrey Wissington, the new president at Southern University. Care for the elderly is an ever-growing social concern, and Sonia Massengale will tell us what some folks in Shreveport are doing about it. Capping off today's show, Al Furrier of Natchitoches and his rockabilly music. I'm Rob Hinton. Those stories and more today on Folks. Everybody's just folks. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Folks. Up front we'll be talking about Southern University, where it is and where it's going. Here to help me sort through some of the issues and concerns facing the state's largest predominantly black university is its new president, Dr. Joffrey Wissington. Dr. Wissington, welcome, welcome to Folks. Thank you. Well, you've been on the job now for almost two months. This has it proved to be everything that you uh, thought it was going to be? <laughs> well, actually, I'm really enjoying myself. It's turned out to be a big party. I have read that you have a five-year plan to move Southern University from a position of excellent, excellence to a position of preeminence. Yes. How do you plan to uh, do that? Well, that is one of our major goals. One of the things that we are taking a look at at this particular point, uh, we're looking at all programs at the university. Really, we're making an evaluation and doing an assessment of every facet of the university's operation. Within this five-year long-range plan, we're going to update this plan on an annual basis. That will include program review, looking at each academic area. We're going to do an assessment of our faculty to continue to send those individuals on to graduate and professional school to improve their earned degrees in areas where it's needed. We have about 40% of our faculty that earn doctorate on the Baton Rouge campus. In New Orleans, we have about 60%. So it will turn out to be a review of all areas at the university, thereby improving and enhancing all of our programs. In the short time that you've been at Southern, what do you find to be the, the challenges facing the university? Well, Southern University was an excellent university prior to my being selected as president. Uh, as you know, I was with the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools in Atlanta, which accredits all of the institutions in the South, from Texas to Virginia and also Latin America. Therefore, I had an opportunity for a 16-year period to visit a number of institutions, uh, critiquing programs, evaluating each institution for reaffirmation of accreditation. I was also fortunate enough to visit a number of the institutions in the state of Louisiana. Therefore, I am bringing with me 16 years of experience in accreditation, as well as our new executive vice president, Dr. Harold Wade, that worked with the Southern Association. Uh, with uh, Dr. Wade, as well as two other individuals we're bringing to the university, we have a very strong academic team. And uh, this team will be able to put together a program to assist the university in refining and improving programs. And this is why we're going into this five-year long-range plan. I've also read that you're going to strive for a closer relationship between the administration and faculty, administration and student body. Have these relationships been strained in, 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 the, in the past, or why the emphasis there? Well, I would think that the university has that in place now. Uh, we have a very competent and dedicated faculty. We have some 525 faculty members. We really have an international faculty. We also have an international student body. We have more than 1,200 international students. And we have students from 45 of our states, as well as students representing four to three countries. So I think we have the diversity which is needed. Uh, we're student-centered. As a matter of fact, you'll find that our total administrative staff is student-centered. And uh, we'll be talking with the students in a convocation. Uh, we get around the campus and we meet with students in the dining hall, in the dormitories, and uh, even we invite them into our office because we have an open door policy, and even into our home. So I would think that we have a very cooperative uh, working relation, and uh, we intend to improve upon that. 
education, how would you describe the quality of education at Southern University? The quality of education uh, is outstanding, and this is why we have the theme moving from excellence to one of preeminence. Uh, we have a number of our programs accredited by specialized accrediting agencies. In essence, this adds a lot of credibility. It puts the icing on the cake. There are about, cake. There are about eight programs accredited by specialized agencies, and we want all of our programs accredited. Uh, that is a rather ambitious goal because it is going to take additional revenues. But to do that, I think we will be able to get the additional support of our alumni and also the local community in terms of raising funds to bring about uh, the accreditation of these specialized programs. You were recently successful in getting raises for some faculty members. How will this enhance the uh, quality of education at Southern? Well, great, Lynn. I really don't want to take the credit for that. Uh, that was uh, done by the Board of Supervisors, uh, by our Board of Supervisors following a, a faculty study uh, under the leadership of Dr. Jesse Stone. And of course, I'm trying to build on the foundation that was established by Dr. Stone, as well as the other presidents of the university. And I have simply had the opportunity to implement those raises. You want to increase student enrollment. How do you plan to do this? We are really improving our programs. This year, we added a doctoral program in the area of special education. Uh, you can really call us a comprehensive university. We're multi-purpose. Uh, we offer a number of programs. And of course, I think to have the doctoral program, um, that is one thing that will certainly entice a number of students to enroll in the university. Now, next year, we will also have the PhD program in accountancy. So we have programs across the board, and we can meet the needs of all students who enroll. Are efforts by other universities throughout the state, let's say like LSU, and their efforts to recruit minority students, are, is that going to hurt your efforts to in increase your student enrollment? I would think not. Uh, first of all, I think that all of our institutions, as we work with them to improve opportunity and access uh, for our students, we like all students, whether they are minority students or non-minority students, to attend college. But we would like for those students to come to Southern University. Uh, those students also will benefit from our dual degree program that we have in a number of areas uh, between Southern University and Louisiana State University. We also have programs with Southeastern Louisiana University. So we're working together, taking advantage of our academic common marketplace that will make it better for all students who attend Southern University. What about non-minority students to comply with the state consent decree? Uh, where does it stand now and how do you plan to increase non-minority student enrollment? Well, I think that uh, we have just about reached the goal that was established some time ago. Uh, across the board, we have about 6% of our student body uh, with non-minority students, and we're working to increase that. One of the things that we were able to do this year under the consent decree, we were able to employ a, a non-minority recruiter. In other words, a majority recruiter for white students. That, that sounds rather strange on a black campus. Uh, but we do have an individual uh, who will focus uh, his time mainly on recruiting uh, white students. What are some of the things that you're telling white students in order to entice them to Southern University? Well, we're telling them the same thing we would tell any student. I think because of the fact that uh, there are certain myths about certain institutions, uh, people have negative feelings. And uh, I think that once an individual visit our campus uh, to look at the number of students we have outside of the state, uh, to look at the diversity, to look at the very strong faculty that we have, then, of course, that student would be made to feel at home. But we have every program that any student would desire to uh, enroll in at the university, whether it's in engineering, architecture, in the sciences, in the humanities, in the arts, uh, you name it, and we have it. Money Wolves, the commissioner of administration, has ordered all state agency to draft their 1986-87 budgets at 78% of what is believed it will cost to continue at this year's level of services. That's a 22% cut. What will that mean as far as Southern University is concerned? It will have a definite negative impact of, upon our programs across the board. And we would hope that we are able to find additional, find additional revenue so that that, that will not happen. Uh, if it does, it means that we'll have to have drastic cutbacks and uh, it will affect all of the institutions in the state, not only Southern University. But hopefully that will not happen. Do you, if it does happen, do you foresee layoffs as, as part of that? If it happens, uh, we will have to go into a period of retrenchment. As a matter of fact, we're in a period of fiscal austerity at this point. Uh, we're still trying to overcome the 3% cut. And another cut uh, has been proposed following uh, the Christmas holidays. So to get into next year with a 22% cut, that would really be devastating. For many years, public colleges like Southern didn't go after private money 
primarily because they didn't have to. I'm wondering, many uh, public colleges are now, cha are, that's changing for many public colleges, and I wonder if that's also happening for Southern University. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's one of the goals of the president. We must get out and find external funds to supplement as well as complement the funds that we receive from the state. We're receiving only 77% of our funds from the state. I, we have a total budget of $58 million. Therefore, we must call on foundations and uh, the private sector uh, to enhance our programs with additional revenues. So that is a major goal. How intense is your need from the private sector? for? Support? It is very intense. What we are pl planning to do at this point, we have Dr. Elaine brimmer Lou now that will be taken off as December 1 as our new vice president for institutional advancement. She will work in a dual role, primarily in the area of fundraising and development, and she'll also have the responsibility for institutional research and planning. And we're planning to put together a fundraising campaign. We're going to start, first of all, on our campus. We want to then involve the local community. Then we'll go statewide. Then we'll hit the region, and then we'll have it on a national basis. But we're planning to put together a national fundraising campaign. What about support from alumni? Is that lacking? No, we have one of the best alumni federations that you'll find on any campus, black or white. We have more than 85,000 former students. Uh, Mr. Donald Wade heads up the alumni federation. He's been with us about 15 years, one of our distinguished graduates. And uh, we have a very good alumni group uh, on a local basis. You'll find it. I've been able to visit just about each week, an alumni association somewhere in the state. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Seattle, Washington. We have excellent support. We have a very fine National Alumni Federation meeting each summer. And last year, we were in Chicago. And this year, we're going to be in Atlanta in July. So we're very pleased with our support there. Final question. The Bayou Classic is coming up soon. If you were a betting man, who would you put your money on, Southern or Grambling? I'm not a betting man, but I'll tell you two things about the Bayou Classic. First of all, I'm going to tell you the score before the game, which is going to be 0-0. Zero, zero. And the team that will win is going to be Southern University. <laughs> okay, Dr. Wissigan, <laughs> thank you for taking time to be with us on Folks today. <laughs> thank you. Time now for a question from the Folks Almanac. The first black woman in the country to earn a doctoral degree in chemical engineering was honored by the Sibagagi Corporation in 1983 as an exceptional black scientist. Do you know who she is? Well, we'll tell you later on in the program. Our next story deals with the elderly. Today, people are living longer, and the elderly have become an ever-growing segment of our society. But along with this increase in the number of senior citizens are growing social concerns like housing and care for the elderly. Well, Sonia Massengale found a very intriguing program addressing some of these issues in Shreveport, particularly for those senior citizens on a low income. While many social service organizations are failing in today's economy, Humana Socialization of Shreveport is flourishing in spite of a tight budget. We have the greatest team of people that has ever been comprised within the organization. An executive director who is unwilling to stop, unrestricted by any means in making sure that his success is a success. And workers who, even when there's a crunch that we had a 10% cut on the $200,000, we lost $20,000. They did not lessen their services. It's the staff of people that we put together and the concern and dedication that they have toward the job. We wear many hats. Uh, I have a position of the executive director. My secretary had the position of secretary. The counselor had the position of counselor and, and so on and, and so forth. But whenever there's a need, whenever there's a, a lack in one department, we'll change hats in the New York second. Uh, we are not obligated, uh, like in speaking with Representative Singh, and he said, to having a 8.30 to 5 o'clock job. Uh, we are there when the need is there. Humana's drawing card is their nutrition program, which has three satellite sites and a meal delivery service for those who can't make the trip to the centers. I couldn't do without it. I would have a terrible time doing without it. I can mess around and fix myself a little breakfast, but I can't cook the food that I need. If, a, if somebody puts the food in the meal, I, I'm just not able to um, cook my food that I need. And with this, I have, it's a balanced diet. And it's everything in the, in the faith that your body needs. And that's why I appreciate it so much. And I look forward to that every day. I know I can always call on Ernest. And when I need to go to the doctor and I've got no other way to go, I call Ernest. 
and he's going to find a way. If he doesn't have a way, he's going to find a way. Takes me to the doctor and waits for me and brings me home. And that is the most wonderful thing I know of. Although there are several other service organizations in the Shreveport area, Humana focuses on those who have been overlooked by larger organizations. It's just helping so many people, so many people like me and so many of my friends that, that depend on it. They don't know what to do without it. We just, we just think it's just so wonderful, most wonderful thing that's ever happened to us. The Black Nurses Association provides blood pressure checks as well as other health-related services at the Humana Centers. Our aim is to increase the number of participants with controlled blood pressures and also to provide some health assessment needs for them in terms of medication regime and decreasing salt in their diet and that kind of thing. I think the program has been well received. We began with an idea. Um, Humana provides nutritional meals for these participants and we decided that it was an opportunity for us to provide some health screening assessments as well. And since May, we have come in and we have provided these services to the participants and have gotten nothing but 100% participation from staff and the participants. We need the heart, we need the understanding of the people on a local basis, state basis, and a federal basis to look at uh, this resource of people that we have and say, let's not warehouse them. Let's not cast them aside. We need to look at our senior citizens and what they are, an abundance of amount of wealth and intelligence, and try to pull some of those resources from them to help us. Because the things that we're going through right now, they've gone through them numerous times. And if we would just have a sensitive ear and sit down and listen, we could learn a lot and not, and not make the same mistakes over and over again. In addition to the nutrition and health maintenance programs, Humana also offers craft classes, transportation services, and other organized group activities. Rockabilly music. Have you ever heard of it and wondered what it is? Well, we did, and we found out from this man, Al Furrier, considered by many to be the king of rockabilly. Situated on the banks of Sibley Lake in Natchitoches Parish is the Southern Comfort Lounge. It is there we had our first experience with rockabilly music. Rockabilly is a country tune speeded up. I was writing songs back when I was a kid, and I just wrote a country song, and me and the band speeded it up. So they say that I'm the first one that ever wrote a rockabilly tune. Well, hey, little baby, let's go downtown. Do the rockabilly when the sun goes down. Let's rock. Well, hey, little baby, let's go downtown. Do the rockabilly, baby. You got your rockin' shoes Come on, little baby, let's rock away the blues Let's rock Let's rock Let's do the rock a feel that baby when the sun goes down Get little baby, move it all around. Do the rockabilly when the sun goes down. Let's rock. Let's rock. Let's do the rockabilly, baby, when the sun goes down. Let's rock. Let's rock. Let's do the rockabilly, baby, when the sun goes down. You're the prettiest little woman that I've ever seen. Al Furrier is the man behind the vocals, and many people in the international music industry consider him the king of rockabilly. There's a guy by the name of Hank Hogberg came over uh, from uh, Switzerland and he was looking for songs for other people to record from overseas. And uh, he came down to the Gold Band Studios in uh, Lake Charles where I recorded a lot of records. And he got this record called Let's Go Bop in the Night that we'd recorded down there. And he brought it back home. So they started playing it around. I said, well, we'd rather have the man on that 
record like it is, you know, and uh, for anyone else to record it. So it made a hit over there in 1975 and got on the charts. Furrier's music is doing exceptionally well in Europe. A lot of his success there can be attributed to French disc jockey Ferdinand Semino. Old, old music is selling over there now better than the new stuff. That's, you know, they like, uh, they still love Elvis Presley over there. And, and they buy uh, most all the records I put out. Uh, I have a DJ over that played uh, nine of my records in, in an hour on one of his shows. And uh, I, I think, you know, he must like it by that. <laughs> he sent me a tape of it. Of course, I couldn't understand what he's talking about. He's talking in French. <laughs> but uh, we brought it to a French teacher here in Nactus, and she uh, changed it where we could, and then back into English. And he's calling me the king, you know, and stuff like that, which made me feel good. Furrier says rockabilly music was born back in the early 1950s. Before rockabilly, he played country, heavily influenced by the music of Hank Williams. Back in the 50s, when I hear him sing on the radio, I try to sing the love sick blues like him, you know, and that was hard to do. I don't think nobody else could do it, just like Hank Williams. And uh, I started playing over in uh, Gaston, Alabama. And started singing some of his songs. I was on the Midway Jamboree in Gaston, Alabama, which every time I would sing one of his songs, that's how, you know, people would applaud real good. So I started writing my own songs, and uh, I just sort of got the urge from uh, Hank Williams. Furrier has recorded 14 albums. Here is a look at some of them. He says his favorite is Country with Sax. I was the first man that ever put a saxophone on a country record down at the Gold Band Studios. I was the first man that ever did that. The guy that owns the record company down there, when I walked in, and then I had a guy playing saxophone with me. His name was Jack Hooter. He's from Alexandria, Louisiana. And he said, well, what's this big tall guy going to do on this? We had the steel guitars and all that stuff. Going to cut a country session. I said, he's going to blow sax, saxophone on it. He said, we can't use a sax on the country record. We've got to have a steel, because the radio station won't play it, and they wouldn't. But we've cut a record called I'll Try One More Time, got number 10 in the charts, and every radio station around was playing it. And after then, I heard saxophones on all kinds of country music. But I was the first man that ever put a saxophone on the country record. Back in the 50s, Furrier played in the Louisiana Hayride. He says another singer at the Hayride asked to record his first rockabilly song, but he said no. A new furrier says he would later regret. Well, I played the Louisiana Hayride four times, and the four times I was up there, Elvis was there. And uh, he uh, wanted to record Let's Go Bop in the Night. He asked for it. He said, send this song to uh, Sam Phillips in Memphis, Tennessee for me, and I'll record it. And I said, well, I'll try to put it over myself, which I made a bad mistake. That's one bad mistake I made by not letting Elvis record it. And he was just breaking That's All Right Mama in, you know, then. And I should have let him have the song to record. Let's now listen to the song that Elvis wanted to record. Well, hey, baby, come on over here and let's go popping tonight. Well, hey, baby, come on over here and let's go popping tonight. Well, I'll always love and I'll always treat you right. Well, I got the car, got the moon. Come on now, baby, let's have some fun. Hey, pretty baby, come on over here and let's go poppin' tonight. Well, I'll always love and I'll always treat you right. Let's go, 
Well, I'll always look and I'll always treat you right Well, I'll always look and I'll always treat you right Well, I guess I'm ready to go out bopping tonight. Okay, time now to answer the question from our folks' almanac, which went like this. The first black woman in the country to earn a doctoral degree in chemical engineering was honored by the Sibagaygi Corporation in 1983 as an exceptional black scientist. Do you know who she is? Well, her name is Dr. Jenny Patrick. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week, a program commemorating five years of folks, and we hope to see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>